Welcome everyone to Church Online. Great for you to join us this morning. And the weatherman tells me it's going to be a beautiful day. So if you're joining us on YouTube this morning, why not jump across to our Church Online platform where you can say hello to me in the chat and the rest of the team. We can also do some live prayer for you there too if you wanna to reach out with any prayer needs. Let us know that you're there. And this morning in all of our services, we are praying for our nation. So we're gonna to pray together online too. And many years ago, I felt God challenged me to pray personally for religious freedom in our nation. And it, I really felt impressed in my heart that my prayer and my commitment to that was gonna make a difference. And I was so overwhelmed that I could make a difference at a government level. But we've been reading the book of James together and it tells us that the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So I want you to believe that this morning as we pray for our nation, our prayers are powerful and effective. So God, right now, online together, wherever we are, we join together and we commit our hearts to pray for our great nation, Australia. I ask you, God, that you would heal any division that our nation is feeling right now. I ask you that your will would be done through our governmental leaders, all the people in authority, that your kingdom would come and that your will would be done in this nation. And I ask God for religious freedom. I ask that it would be enshrined into our constitution, protected through legislation, God. These things we ask, knowing our prayers are powerful and effective in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. So thanks church. This morning we have Mark McLennan. He's going to continue our series on the book of James and share with us a message on grace and humility. But before that, before we jump into it, I'm going to hand over to our creative team and they are going to lead us in worship. He's worthy of it all.
been a difficult week. Don't you hate it when you hear a great message like what Dan delivered to us last week and the whole of your week becomes a series of opportunities where you have the, the choice of putting into practice what you've been taught. Sue and I have had a week of James. Situations that have tested us and on what Dan reminded us about faith and action. And each time a situation presents itself, there's that, oh, I've got to do something here, don't I? Yeah, so thanks for that, Dan. Also, thanks for saying the term looks like a half-chewed minty. Haven't had a chance to use it yet, but I'm going to try. But really, I always find studying the book of James to be like that. James is a bit like Old Testament book of Proverbs, all wrapped up in New Testament clothes. And he has a great way of focusing on practical situations in the life of a Jesus follower. And he gives us these fairly blunt reminders, and he is blunt at times, encouraging God's people to just act like God's people. Because for James, a faith that doesn't produce real life change is no faith at all. Fun fact about James, James was the brother of Jesus, but he didn't become a follower of Jesus until after the resurrection. I find that astounding because he would have sat at all of the dinner tables in his family home and said, oh, did you hear what Jesus did down at the lake, walked on water? Did you hear how he fed 5,000 people? But didn't follow Jesus. But after the resurrection, he went on to become the head of the church in Jerusalem. And his letter that he has written is just amazing. I like that for James, faith was not an abstract idea. Real faith in Jesus has real effects in life. And he gives lots of practical examples to illustrate that point. like how real faith endures in the midst of trials. Faith calls on God for wisdom in every situation. Faith allows us to hold our tongue. It doesn't roll the eyes at the less fortunate. It doesn't ignore the plight of others or curse those who don't agree with our thinking or our beliefs. But all of that brings you to this one question in James. How do I actually apply this? And you're left asking yourself, how do my actions mirror the faith that I proclaim to have? I don't like that question. I don't think many of us like the way we answer that question at different times. And you can be sure that the Christians that James was writing to were not any different to us at all. They were still into all of the same behaviours and activities and outcomes that we have today, just without a camera or a, a social media site to uh, record it. But before I dig in too much to our topic today, which is how grace and humility come together in James, I want to just let you know that the last time I listened to a message on humility, I just wanted to leave. Because the person who delivered the message, not here, was just so not humble. And it just felt so hypocritical to hop up and talk about these things. So if there's at any point that you feel I'm pointing a finger at you, just know that I'm pointing three fingers back at me because I struggle with this stuff too. So let's look at James' words in chapter 4 and verse 1. What is causing quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? You want what you don't have. So you scheme and you kill to get it. You're jealous of what others have, but you can't get it. So you fight and wage war to take it away from them. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. So pretty much, same, same as us today. Then James, because he's a practical guy, goes on in verse 6 with a very simple practical solution. And he says, but he, meaning God, gives us more 
grace. That's why the scripture says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come close to God and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts for the, your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Let there be tears for what you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. And he finishes with, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up in honour. Now to understand how grace is the answer to our pride, we probably need to be clear on what they both are. Grace really is the basis of the Christian faith. We enter into relationship with Jesus. We are saved through grace. And God's grace is usually defined as undeserved favour. We don't deserve it, but he gives it away anyhow. Because he loves us. It can't be earned. It's something that is freely given. And we count on God's grace as the bridge that he has built in our relationship with him. Grace is everywhere in the Bible. From the foundation of the Old Testament, we see that grace is a part of God's character. He is a loving and gracious God. I love how Richard Rohr puts it when he says, grace is not something that God gives. Grace is who God is. Then in the Old Testament, then in the New Testament, we learn about the role of grace in our faith walk as in our ongoing lives. As we experience God's grace in our lives, we seek to be more like Jesus. That's the goal. We then hopefully, in turn, have more grace with others. And having a grace-filled heart encourage us to share God's grace, his love, his mercy, his forgiveness, and all of those other things. But that has been our struggle from day dot. Because we might be okay at receiving grace, but we aren't very good at integrating it into our lives or paying it forward, which is what leads to the quarrels and the unforgiveness that James is addressing in this letter. And then we have humility. Humility, in its simplest form, is literally lowliness of mind. It's not thinking less of ourselves, it's thinking of ourselves less. Humility is understanding ourselves in the proper sense, in light of who God is and who we are and living accordingly. God is the creator and sustainer of the universe and we are not. So a humble person recognises that all that they have, everything that is given to them, every situation that they are blessed with is a gift from God. And when we humble ourselves in the sight of God, our hearts somehow become connected to him. So in every situation we face, when we are confronted by anger, when we are looking at something magnificent and it just moves us, even when we sin, humility provides the conduit for us to confess our pride and faults and lead right in, lean right into the grace that God offers in order to maintain a process of change which eventually, hopefully, will bring us more into Christ's likeness. And in response, God keeps providing more grace. But I think we can agree that humility is hard. And what usually shows more in our lives is the opposite of humility, which is pride. 
I found it interesting in the Bible that the word for pride in this sense, uh, in the sense of haughty or boastful behaviour, is made up of two Greek words. The first part you will know probably, it's hupere, which is hyper. A hyperactive child is one that has overly active, got lots of energy, like my grandson Yaden. <laughs> the next part of the word means to appear. It's the word ephanos, from which we get the word phantom. A phantom being an apparition, something not real. So pride then becomes this actively seeking to be something that we are not, something that is false and not real. Recently, Sue and I returned from a beautiful four-month holiday around the world, from South America to Jordan. And what we noticed is that there is now one constant at every location you visit, anywhere around the world. So when you climb into the tomb of Tutankhamun, there standing before the sarcophagus will be someone going... <laughs> trying to find the best Instagram picture that they can pop up on their post. At Dachau, the Nazi war camp, in front of a gas chamber, there was someone doing that. And it's sickening. People are there not to see, to reflect, and to marvel. They are there to be seen. And when they have their photo and have finished holding everybody else up who wants to just have a look and have a moment with what they are seeing, they scurry off to their next location for more pics. Social media is possibly a, a good way of getting a glimpse at how pride operates. See, we rarely show any pictures or content that hasn't been carefully curated to ensure that it points and paints the very best picture of us, a smiling, successful version of us, the big life, beautiful moments of us. And often so do social media posts share very little of what the entire rest of our life is really like. They show more of a phantom, or a shadow of what our life is like. Humility is perhaps one of the most elusive of the godly characteristics. God sees both pride and humility in our hearts. We tend to only see what appears on the surface. It makes it easy for any of us to give the impression that we are something that we are not. And a person who has that prideful heart can often appear humbly outward. And what James is trying to do is to help us understand in this passage that sometimes we allow our inner struggles, our inner need for significance or security to take us to all the wrong places to find it. So our need for significance will often take us to look for love in all of the wrong places, make ourselves look better than we really are, or trying to appear as if we have it all together and we've got it all going on. Our need for security causes us to fill our world with things that make us look impressive, cars, houses, holidays, things that don't last, the castles of cards that we build around ourselves to make ourselves look impressive. And let me clarify, none of these things are bad. As long as they don't come from that sense of pride that can so easily consume us. James wants us to understand our pride and its impact on our relationship with the Almighty God. And to let us know that if we are struggling with pride, and if it's taking up room in our, in our soul that perhaps could be better occupied by God, there's more grace for us to keep working at it. There is more grace. But it requires us to drop the veil, to accept who we really are, And that the capacity to do all of that comes from only one place, 
total and absolute dependence upon God. See, I think we have trouble accepting God's freely given grace. We can sing about it, we can describe it, but we struggle to accept God's grace personally because of our ego. See, grace is so humiliating for our ego because free gifts say nothing about us being strong and superior and capable people. Our ego ego doesn't know how to receive things freely and without logic. It likes to feel worthy or in control. And it needs to understand things in order to accept them. Our ego will constantly steer us towards a worldview where only the clever win, where only the strong survive, where we are deserving because of the work that we put in. We get what we are, have gotten based on our merit. But really, right there, that thinking and identifying that thinking in ourselves is the very beginning of how we start to overcome it. And that process is at the very core of the gospel of Jesus, isn't it? Because the only way we can ever overcome our pride can only be and has only ever been through Jesus. But the problem is our unwillingness to get into that process. But fortunately, there's more grace. There is more grace. And it's through God's love for us and his deep sense of desire for relationship with us that we actually get a glimpse of his humility, his graciousness and his love. It's only when we are willing to step into what Richard Raw refers to as an economy of grace that we can see that. All God wants is free and willing partners. And while ever we battle to stay in an economy of merit, we will never be able to process this free gift of grace. John 15:15 15, 15 says, and it's Jesus speaking. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. Not servants, but friends. That's God's plan. Yet still, many of us seem to prefer being servants. As if an actual divine relationship with the almighty God is just too incredible to imagine. So we just keep working at being good, at appearing humble, at doing the right things, acting holy. And as such, we never get to experience the friendship that comes from allowing God to just be in every aspect of our life. But I want to encourage you so much in that. Because when I finally understood the sort of relationship that God wanted to have with me, and ridiculously, it wasn't that long ago, it was like a window opened and a fresh breeze just blew in. And the very relationship that I had been trying to, to work out and make happen right through my life to try and create with my creator God just started to happen. I stopped trying to discipline myself to make sure I prayed each morning and read the scriptures and beat myself up when I didn't. I stopped looking for every opportunity to do the right thing and appear like I was a nice person. I stopped worrying about how people perceived me and just allowed Jesus to be, to be involved in every aspect of my life, to be a part of how I start each day from the minute I open my eyes, to be a part of the many, many conversations that go on in my head about everything, and that's a constant. I started to acknowledge him, him, when things went my way. 
and trusting him when they didn't. I thanked him when I saw things that were beautiful and man, have I seen some beautiful things. And I questioned him when there were things that were happening that I didn't understand and I needed some guidance. And I noticed that I began to feel his presence in my life. I allowed him to make me aware of the things that he wanted me to do. People, he wanted me to help. And situations where I needed to take a stand and do something. And I began to feel comfortable, not only in my own skin, but in who God sees me as. And I love it. I just love it. But I wish I'd gotten to this point so much back, back, back there in my life. What I came to know is that if we're honest, we allow our culture to form us much more than we allow Jesus to. It's like we've kept the basic storyline of humanity and history in place rather than allowing the gospel and the message of Jesus to reframe and redirect our story. And we struggle to experience grace at our core. And we end up missing out on the new mind that Paul talks about in Romans 12 too. Or the new self, like he describes in Ephesians 4, 23 and 24. To be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on a new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. The old, tired, win-lose scenario seemed to have somehow imprinted itself on our cultural hard drive. Whereas the experience of grace which James reminds us there is more of, is so much more imaginative and satisfying. And it imprints a new win-win program on our psyche. People out there who live their entire lives inside a system of competing and measuring and earning and counting and performing, fail to understand how a win-win scenario that Jesus paints in the gospel could ever be interesting and attractive. I think the challenge for us individually and for our church as a whole is to ensure that we aren't adding to the problem and somehow mirroring the dominant culture of our time instead of transforming it. We need to showcase God's love in a way that changes the paradigms of reward and punishment, good guys versus bad guys, who's in, who's out. But it's only by fully understanding and just tapping into the grace offered, offered to us. Draw near to God and we find ourselves encouraged to do it more because there's a promise to that line that he will draw near to us. Maybe you're here this morning and you're feeling you know about God. You know about his love, his acceptance. You even know about his grace. But you want to know more about his grace. You want help dealing with what you're currently facing in your life. But you've been waiting for God to contact you. I think we sometimes get that round a little bit the wrong way. We feel that God needs to contact us, but really we need to get on our knees and contact him. James says it simply, without doubt, that if you draw near to God, he will draw near to you. But there's an action required to that. And every time that your pride tries to take back control, you're going to need to remind yourself, there is more grace. There is more grace. I'll just keep working at this. There's a lot to change and God's got his work cut out for him, but there is more grace.
close in prayer. And it might be that this morning you've gained a little more appreciation of God's grace and you just would like to tap into it. Maybe you have never had an opportunity to connect with God, to create that conduit with God. And right now, I just want to give you that opportunity as we close in prayer with all eyes closed. I want to encourage you to take that first step. If you feel God is knocking at the door of your heart right now, don't try and work it out in your head. Don't, you, won't, you won't understand it. Respond to your soul. Your soul is the only thing that understands it, not your head, not your ego. I want you to just raise your hand as that first step and I want to be able to pray with you if that's you. We want to be able to pray with you and allow you to continue to tap into God's grace. Father God, I just thank you for the words of James that just remind us so clearly of those areas of our life that we're not doing really well at. Thanks, Father, for the practical application of your word that whilst it may have been written to a group of people way back, it so applies to us, Father, and we just need to take you at your word to allow you to begin a work in us, a work of change, a work of enriching, a work of excitement, Lord. Father, keep our hearts open. Never let us feel that we've got it all together or that we've got it all in control. Father, just keep working with us, I pray. Amen. Thank you, Mark. Your life is a beautiful example of grace and humility, so we really appreciate your message today. And just a word on our giving. Online, we have so many people who tune in, uh, but I wanted to encourage you with the words of the Apostle Paul. In a number of his letters, he encouraged the people to support those who were instructing them or feeding them spiritually. So in one of those passages, he actually says these famous verses, a man reaps what he sows. He says, you know, give to the one who instructs you. And he goes on to say, a man reaps what he sows. So I pray that you will reap a harvest for your giving here at Macquarie. And tonight, just letting you know, we have Resound On, which is a night where we let loose with ministry and worship. So we invite you to come along. That would be a great night for you to be in the room. We also have a prayer and worship night this Tuesday. It's an all-in prayer and worship night, so everyone is welcome. Uh, and remember, the, prayer, the prayers of a righteous person are powerful and effective. So come along to that. And two dates coming up for your diary. Mac Women on the 20th of November. You have Christmas on the deck with wine and cheese and carol singing. One of our favourite Mac Women nights of the year. It's a great one to bring a friend. Register online for that. And on the 4th of November, as part of our new season, the Fivefold and the Equipping of the Saints, we have a prophetic workshop with Helen and Malcolm Calder. She is a great prophet in our nation. They run a prophetic school in Melbourne and they'll be running a half day workshop for us. So register online for that one too. Well, that's it, folks. Thank you for leaning in and being part of our service today. Next week, we have Ros there, and she's going to finish off our series on James, the final chapter, which calls us to draw near to God and to pray. So we look forward to seeing you next week.